valve float. You've heard about it, but what is it and how do you solve it? Well, what it is, is completely destructive to horsepower and actually destructive to engines themselves. How do you solve it? That's what this episode is all about. First up, I better explain exactly what it is. From a driver's point of view, it's when you're at the top of the gear revving the thing out and the engine just bleh, rolls over, maybe starts to backfire, maybe starts to just completely lose power and fall on its face. And that's often because of this thing that is called floating the valves or what we call sort of more accurately, losing control of the valve. You've got your camshaft, which runs right through the center of the engine and spins at half of engine speed. Then you've got your lifter, which follows the lobe on the camshaft. And as the camshaft rotates, those lifters are moving up and down following that lobe. Next, there is a push rod that rides inside that lifter and comes up here into the cylinder head and engages with the rocker arm. The rocker arm, as the name implies, rocks back and forth. And it translates that motion of the camshaft to the tip of the valve. Both the exhaust valve and the intake valve have rocker arms riding on them so that it pushes these and it opens and closes. The thing is, the cam is really only opening the valve. What's responsible for closing the valve and for keeping it closed is the valve spring. So the valve spring becomes the most important component in this whole shebang because it has to keep the valve closed while all of the other combustion events are happening. And then as the camshaft opens it, it has to return the valve to its seat or close the valve. What happens in valve float is everything is moving so fast or you've got a component failure or something too heavy that that valve spring cannot control that valve and it starts to open and close at the wrong time. It might bounce off of its seat. It might hang open instead of actually ever closing. And when that happens, of course, the components of that four stroke cycle completely are shafted, air starts to flow the wrong way in the engine, you get misfires, you get backfires, you get no horsepower. And if you're watching Engine Masters, you know that's unacceptable. The engine that we're gonna be running here is a worst case scenario for valve float problems. It's a big block Chevrolet with a hydraulic roller camshaft. And what makes that terrible is that the lifter itself is very heavy. The standard geometry in a big block Chevy has the push rods running all cattywampus. They're not directly in line with the rocker arm. That can create difficulties. It's got a big rocker arm with a 1.7 ratio, which is steep, and it has valves that are really big and really heavy. So this is the engine that we see have more valve float problems than any other application with a hydraulic roller camshaft, and that's why we've chosen it. First of all, your 454 is a pooch. <laughs> where, where did he it's leave his horsepower? Dog. How do you have a 454 that doesn't even make 500 horsepower? The numbers here are 542.4 pound-feet of torque and a disappointing 473.1 horsepower. But you can see the problem, which is exactly what we're trying to demonstrate, is right there on the curb, as soon as the valve train starts to lose control, what happens? Boom, you You're stop making horsepower. Stop making horsepower. You can see the downturn in power there. Uh, let's also look at the downturn in airflow. That's gonna be the key. Now, wait till you see the curve of airflow and what happens when the valves float, the same exact thing. See, I mean, you could see this same issue in a curb if let's say it was an ignition misfire. Right. And you're looking at just power and torque. But here's the giveaway right here is, it was flowing 628 CFM at, uh, 5400 right and by 5600 6. it was down to 621 so the air was actually going backwards which tells us it's a mess. What's Intake happening is, yeah, the valves are opening and closing out of sync with what the piston wants to be doing. Or staying open. Or at staying that open. Point. It's just lost control. Yeah. So let's talk about what that's actually doing. So we, we talk about valve float, which means the valves not opening and closing in time with what we really want them to do, or bouncing off the seat. I mean, there's all sorts of horrible things that can happen, but how about the other damage that you can see from this? 
Well, I mean, had we run it another 300 RPM, we may have seen that lack of valve relief in the piston. Could have seen a piston crash. You'll see retainers get, get beat up and keepers sucked through. I mean, it, it just turns into a sledgehammer, literally, you on top of the valve. You can break a valve, valve drop a valve, and destroy your whole engine. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's, it's a worst case scenario, you know, really, valve float is. When we have that question, it's interesting. On the chassis dyno, we can open the hood, take the air cleaner off, and actually look at it without an air hat, and you'll actually see fuel come back up out above the carburetor oh, as the fuel standoff, off, yeah. because the intake valve is staying open. So now the fuel, instead of going in the cylinder being captured, right back up to the carburetor, and it, and it shows the same thing in the power Yeah, my cruise. upshot is when you get to the valve float, shift. <laughs> right? That's <laughs> true. Well, because then you fall down to lower RPM and yeah. you're no longer in distress. What you don't want to do is just sit there at wide open throttle at valve float, just going, yeah. what's going on? Is it missing? Yeah. So the process that we use to go ahead and change valve springs, and for safety, we air up the cylinder. We create enough pressure. We bring it to TDC. Then we create cylinder pressure by using a leak down tester, which holds the valves closed. Then we will use this valve spring compressor. There's, this happens to be a Moroso that we've reinforced over the years. What I do is I'll apply a bit of pressure. Then I tap the retainer with a very small hammer, and that will break the keeper loose. Sometimes when they have floated, they get stuck hard, and you've got to take a bigger socket and a much bigger hammer to try and pop it loose uh, and break the retainer from the keeper loose. Um, so we'll go ahead and air up the cylinder, and we'll uh, release it and change the valve spring. So what we originally started with when we had like that 150 on the seat and 310 open was a single outer spring with a dampener. What we're gonna do now is install the corresponding inner spring with it that's gonna bring our pressure up to like 220, I think it was, and 450 or 70. Well, here's our power with our stiffer valve springs. 548.7 pound-feet of torque, 473.3 horsepower. Not really a big change on the horsepower, but the story is in the shape of the curve. It doesn't fall off, and instead of, you know, taking a nose dive at 5,400 RPM, all of a sudden it's carrying to 62, which is what you'd have to do if you were drag racing the thing. Exactly. I mean, you know, before it was within 100 RPM of making peak power. Yeah. And right. that's where it crashed. But it, if that's where it makes peak power, that's not where you want to shift it if it's in a car. You need to go 500 or so, you know, five or 600 past that, yeah. which is what we're able to do now. That puts your shift recovery back in the meat of the yes. power curve. I think that's going to tell the bigger story. That's air sum now. Okay, yeah, there's no drop off like we saw earlier. And now when we compare it with this. Yep. Oh, yeah. See? That's for weird. sure. And look at it shows it down here too. When we were seeing power down here, mm -hmm. it shows it in airflow. So so something right. in the valve train changed, whether it be adjustment, the way it's opening the valve, it's got more bottom in than it had because it, it is interesting to me that the airflow bears out that change. So I'm happy for that just from the fact that it the, the data doubles itself. So it tells us it's true. Mm -hmm. So to conclude this whole thing, for the average guy building a street strip engine, let's talk about all of the components. Is there ever a downside to getting a lighter lifter? You know, I don't think there is really. I mean, I'm not sure which lifter that is specifically in my mind right now, but, but lighter is certainly going to be better. We were talking about push rods, and you were saying weight isn't really the thing, it's stiffness. Well, yeah, because of the push rod flexes. I like to call the push rod going boing, right. and it's just uh, pole vaulting the <laughs> valve, and you're, you're out of control at that point anyway. So stiffness of the push rod is, is very important, more important yep. than weight, I would say. How about the rocker arm? Is there ever a downside to getting an aluminum rocker arm instead of a hardcore stainless steel? From a durability standpoint, even the off-road guys, they all use the higher end aluminum stuff. Mm -hmm, right. But, you know, a standard aluminum rocker arm may not have the durability of like a, a steel rocker arm. Mm -hmm. So first, a lot of it I think depends on RPM. 
If you're looking for a 7,000 RPM hydraulic roller motor, then you probably need a, an aluminum something. When you're looking at a steel rock arm, it's probably not going to be looking at 7,000 very happy. Um, Just because it's heavier? It, no, and it's heavier and it's not going to go there. If it's a 5,500 RPM motor that you want to go 50,000 or 100,000 miles on, then I think a steel rock is the option. Right. So I think for a typical street guy under 6,500 RPM, it's like get the best lifter you can, especially if it's a hydraulic, spend the money and get a super high quality one. Stiff push rods are never a bad idea. Right. Under 6,500 RPM, you're probably good with an aluminum rocker arm, like a, a comp gold or something I like agree. that. Yeah. And uh, don't run a titanium valve. All right, that was lots and lots of information to help you build a better engine. And that is what we do every single time on Engine, engine Masters. Masters.